Amen. Amen. Well, I like Thanksgiving a lot, not just for the food, though you can tell I like food. And, um, but Thanksgiving goes straight to the heart of our foundations as a Christian nation. And the pilgrims coming over in 1620 to um, find religious freedom, freedom to worship and praise and to, to live the way that they feel like God was calling them to live without the government leaning on them and restricting them and persecuting them for their biblical beliefs. Well, that's a big deal. When the folks got on the boat and came on over and uh, founded a nation with a Christian viewpoint, Christian perspective, Christian foundations. So I really like Thanksgiving as a pastor. I really, really like Thanksgiving. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was to share a five minute video about that voyage, that Mayflower voyage that brought the folks over and laid a foundation for the very first. Now it wasn't the very first Thanksgiving celebration because there was several that happened earlier, but it was the first festival, Thanksgiving festival. And so, uh, Tony, go ahead and lower the lights, fire up the video. The Pilgrims. In the patriotic song titled America, the poet called America land of the pilgrim's pride. Who were these pilgrims and where did they come from? About 400 years ago, 13 years after the first English settlement in America called Jamestown, there was another group of travelers who came to America in search of religious freedom. They wanted to worship God in their own way and separate from the Church of England they formed their own congregation and called themselves saints. The saints came under persecution in England, and many of these people moved to Holland in the Netherlands, seeking religious liberty and a better life. In Holland, life became unbearable. These people could not find jobs, and the parents did not like the bad influence that the local culture was having on their own children. The saints packed up their few possessions gathered their families and went back to England. In England, they again faced persecution and were sent to prison. They wanted to go to America, where they could be free to live according to their own beliefs. They bargained and paid for passage across the Atlantic Ocean on two ships, the Speedwell and the Mayflower. In the summer of 1620, these two ships set sail for a new land, where these people could fulfill their hopes and dreams of a new life. 300 miles and many days out to sea, the speedwell began leaking water into the ship. It could not be repaired at sea, and both ships returned to the harbor. It was decided that the Mayflower would sail alone, and the people and cargo that could fit were transferred to the Mayflower. The Mayflower finally set sail for America on the 6th of September, 1620. The passengers on the Mayflower were known as saints, strangers, and crew. Those who were believers and members of the congregation were saints. The strangers were those who were still looking for a better life, away from England, and to get and develop land, but were not members of the congregation. And the crew were the officers and working hands on the ship. Altogether, there were about 130 people. The first half of the voyage went smooth. The seas were calm and good progress was made, but many of the travelers still became sick, and during the second half of the journey, the seas were rough and stormy. The winds were so fierce that the crew had to drop the sails on the ship, allowing it to drift freely. The Mayflower became damaged and many believed they would not make their intended destination. It was a long and difficult voyage. The Mayflower was a small ship, only a hundred feet long. It was crowded. There was not enough fresh water. It was stinky, dirty, and cold. Two people died, one of them a young man who fell overboard during a very turbulent storm. 
he was not recovered. After 66 days at sea, the shipmen cried out, Land ho! America had been sighted. Surprisingly, they were not far from where they intended to make landfall. Upon arriving, the pilgrims made an agreement on paper about how their new colony would be run. They created and signed a document, which today is called the Mayflower Compact. The compact stated they were loyal to the King of England, were Christians who served God, laws they make will be fair, and everyone would work for the good of the colony. Each man, before leaving the ship, was asked to sign the Mayflower Compact. The pilgrims searched the New England coast for a place to settle and decided on the area already named by previous explorers to the area. There was land for planting crops, a harbor for ships, and a river for fresh water. They built their village and established Plymouth Colony in what is now the state of Massachusetts inside Cape Cod. Although the pilgrims were happy to have settled in America, they faced a difficult and cold winter. They were not prepared. They built a large house and some smaller homes, yet for a period people still slept on the Mayflower. That first winter in Plymouth Colony, almost half of the people died. It was a very hard and harsh life. Native Americans were already living in America for thousands of years before these settlers from England arrived. The Native Americans were not surprised to see these new visitors, since explorers and hunters and fishermen had been here before. When the Mayflower arrived, the Native Americans saw these families with men, women, and children come off the ship. It was hoped that they would come in peace. There was not much integration that first winter between the Native Americans and those of Plymouth Colony. The Pilgrims and Native Americans formed a treaty that helped for peaceful relations between these two cultures. They would trade for furs, food, and tools. After the first harvest in 1621, a year after their arrival in this land that held great promise and hope for these immigrants, the Pilgrims invited some of the Native Americans to join them for a feast. The Pilgrims provided food of their harvest, and the Native Americans provided venison from the deer they had hunted. This is referred to as the first Thanksgiving, as the tradition continued after every harvest in the years that followed. Life was not easy for the pilgrims, especially in those first years. The most important thing for them was to freely practice their religion. As the years went by, the community of settlers from England grew to the 13 original colonies, and then to the United States of America. Praise the Lord. I know some politicians have said we're not a Christian nation, but we are. They, they say that to try to appease secular voices, but we are, we are. <laughs> and I declare it to be so in a growing fashion. Um, in our nation that throughout all our institutions we would recognize that our roots and our foundations are found in Christ Jesus and so I celebrate Thanksgiving and the church said amen isn't it amazing that these folks uh, came over on a boat just a few in number came over in a boat and then because of harsh conditions half of them died and yet they formed a nation isn't that incredible that we are still talking about them to this day. Can, uh, can a single person change a nation? Yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. You're a nation changer. And God will use you mightily to advance the cause of Christ right here in the United States. So uh, it's not uncommon for us believers to embrace and understand the spirit of thanksgiving because that goes to our core value as a Christian. We are a thankful people. I'm so thankful God saved my soul. How about you? I'm so thankful I'm washed in the blood. I'm so thankful that I'm filled with this Holy Spirit. I'm so thankful that I have the word of God to lead 
lead me and guide me, the bread of life. I'm so thankful that his favor surrounds me and the blessings of God are mine. I'm just thankful, thankful. And uh, just if it's nothing more than my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we get up every day and say, thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. And that precious book that you have in your hand is a book of thanksgiving. And the theme that, that goes from one end to the other, Genesis to Revelation, is a heart of thanksgiving. From Old Testament to New Testament, a major theme in Scripture is thank you, God. <laughs> thank you for smiling on us with your favor. Thank you for being our, our shield and our buckler. Thank you for being our healer. Thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, our provider, and on and on and on it goes, the Alpha to the Omega. We have so much to be thankful for, and so when you start reading from Old Testament to New Testament, you understand as believers, I know that you understand this, it is central to our identity as Christians that we are a thankful people. Before you came to Jesus, you pretty much thought about yourself. But once you came to Jesus and you realized what Jesus has done for us through the cross, through the blood, the death, burial, and resurrection, there is so much to be thankful for. It took our, our, our focus off of ourselves and put it on him. And, and to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Everybody just say, thank you, Jesus. Don't you find yourself saying that throughout the day? You'll say things like, bless the Lord, or thank you, Jesus. And, and we just automatically, it's almost like, <laughs> excuse me, it's almost just like breathing that we say, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> bless the Lord, <laughs> praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, when you look at the writings of Paul, Paul was a, a praiser. He was a worshiper. He gave us most of the New Testament, and he taught us to be a thankful people. Because when you read his letters to the church at Thessalonica, and the church at Colossae, and the church at Philippi, and the church at uh, Corinth, it's all about Thanksgiving, 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 Thanksgiving. And this comes from a guy that as a missionary, he suffered in the natural realm. I mean, they really, they chased him, they hunted him, they had death threats against him. They had plots to kill him all throughout his ministry. And then he was beaten with, with rods, 39 stripes. He was stoned to death at Lystra, had to be raised from the dead. He was lost at sea, shipwrecked. He was bitten by a viper. He was thrown in jail. He suffered, he suffered, he suffered. Yet during his times of suffering, all he talked about was being thankful unto the Lord. Isn't that a lesson for all of us? Because I'm not sure. Come on, church. I'm not sure. After the shipwreck wreck and the snake bite, I'm not sure I, if I would have been saying, thank you, Jesus, for calling me into the ministry. I mean, after, the, after they beat me 39 times with rods and then stoned me to death, when they raised me from the dead, I'm not sure I would have gotten up and say, thank you, Lord, let's do that again. No, I'm not sure. After they throw you in the jail and the innermost jail and put your feet in stocks and your hands in chains, but you're singing a psalm of thanksgiving, I'm not sure if that would have been, would have been me. I pray that it would have been me, but uh, let's uh, think about that for a moment. Praise the Lord. But Paul said in 1 Thessalon uh, Thessalonians 5, 18, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, give thanks in all circumstance. Hey, is that easy? No. Is it possible? Yes. It, are we called to do it? Yes. Is it God's will? Yes. Let's read it together. Everybody read it together. It'll bless your soul. One, two, three, read. Give thanks in all circumstance, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know what? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you know what that tells me? That tells me that not everything <laughs> blesses me, but I am blessed. That, that even in the hard times, Paul said, 
even if you're thrown into the innermost prison, or even if they're beating you with rods, or even if they, they have a warrant out for your arrest and they want to murder you, no matter what is going on against you, you can still be thankful to Jesus. Why, why, why? Why was he such a thankful man? Because when he was persecuting Jesus and when he was causing Christians to be thrown into jail and when he was on the other side of the coin working against the church and he met Jesus on that Damascus road, Jesus could have slayed him right there. As the just judge, he had every right to slay Paul right there because he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He was persecuting Jesus. Jesus and Jesus could have slain him right there but he didn't he forgave him and he cleansed him and he filled him and he called him and he caused him to be a world changer and he changed the world and he knew that Jesus had done something miraculous in his life Thank you, Jesus. And so when Paul says, give thanks in all circumstance, he knew what he was talking about because he had experienced all sorts of different circumstances for this is God's will for you. Hey, you know what? If you're going through something that's very, very challenging, if you're going through a negative uh, piece, you just thank God and you watch God turn it around to something better than you could have ever imagined. Our God works all things together for good, for those who love the Lord, for the called according to his purpose. God will turn it around. God will turn it around. <laughs> God will turn it around. Hallelujah. So give thanks in all circumstances. Colossians 3 and 15. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts, since as members of one body you're called to peace. And be Thankful. Colossians 3 and 17. Whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Glory to God. Philippians 4 and 6. You know this one. Don't be anxious in anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. With thanksgiving. Everybody say, Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> say, Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Extol the Lord at all times, Psalm 34. Praise his names will always be on my lips. His praise will always be be on my lips. That reminds me of Hebrews 13 and 15. Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. The fruit of our lips giving thanks. The fruit of our lips. Just go ahead and touch your lips right now. Say lips give thanks. Lips give thanks. <laughs> That's right. That's what them lips are for. They give thanks. They're not, they're not for anything else. Well, maybe eating some turkey on turkey day. But in the meantime, they're to give thanks <laughs> to the Lord. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. One of my favorite uh, video mentors, and everybody should have a mentor, and, and I have pastors in my life. Also, uh, on YouTube, I found video mentors that I like very much. Brian Tracy is one. Jim Rohn is another one. There's several others uh, that kind of speak into my life, good Christian businessmen uh, that have a good foundation in the Word. And Brian Tracy said this about the attitude of gratitude. He talks quite a bit about thankfulness, as does Jim Rohn, because they see it as a core value as you are developing a character that invites the blessings of God in your life. Thankfulness invites. Thankfulness is a magnet to favor in your life. Honor is a magnet. Thankfulness is a magnet. Gratefulness is a magnet. And so uh, Brian Tracy calls it the attitude of gratitude. You've heard that phrase before. And attitude or gratitude determines altitude. Well, this is what he says. Research shows that an attitude of gratitude makes us happier strengthens our relationships. That's because nobody wants to live with a grumpy person. <laughs> that makes sense, doesn't it? And it improves your physical health. 
That is, I believe that's true because bitterness eats away on the inside. It, it, the Bible says it causes rottenness of the bones. But an attitude of gratitude improves our physical health. So we as believers, we should be healthy folks because we're so grateful and we're so thankful for all that God has done in our lives. And then he goes on to say, here's five ways to show gratitude daily. Five ways. Number one, he said, be an active listener. In other words, you value somebody and you show your appreciation for somebody when you actively listen to them. You make eye contact. You stop. You open up your ears. You're absorbing what they say. So as an active listener, you are conveying the idea that I have appreciation for what you are telling me right now. It means something to me that you are sharing your thoughts with me. So that's number one. Here's number two. Learn how to accept constructive criticism. Yeah, I don't like that. I'm going on to number three. <laughs> I haven't learned that yet, so I'm just moving on. No, it says learn how to accept constructive. Now, there is non-constructive criticism. There's destructive criticism. And, and you know who often says, we kind of say the worst things about ourselves, don't we? Sometimes we undermine our own self-esteem with self-criticisms uh, that are not biblically based. And that's why we always start out. I'm not sure we did tonight or not, but we normally start out, I am who the Bible says I am. I have what the Bible says I have. I can do what the Bible says. Oh, we start with the video. That's why I didn't do it. But we make this confession over ourselves. I am who the Bible says I am. I have what the Bible says I have. I can do. Because you know what we usually say over ourselves? I can't, I won't, it never will. We're usually our own worst critics. But you know what? Learn how to accept constructive criticism and be gracious when you are challenged. That's hard. That's, that's difficult because uh, it's just hard. Here's number three. Pay it forward forward. This is a big deal. When you are blessed, find someone else to bless the same way because there's a lot of folks that have blessed our lives, isn't there? There's a lot of folks that have spoken wisdom into our lives and helped our lives and taken time to invest into our lives. And it is a, a sign of gratefulness that it, that doesn't stop with me, that doesn't stop with you, but we turn it around and we pay it forward by doing the same thing in somebody else's life. So if someone gave me a break, I'm going to give someone else a break. Come on. If someone gave me a bit of wisdom, I'm going to share that bit of wisdom. Amen? I'm going to pass along. Debbie and I are open books. If we figure something out, we share it. We write it down. We put it in a book. We, we try to get that information out so that it can help somebody else. Here's number four. Of course, thank the people in your life. Thank the people in your life, in your inner circle. Be thankful. Tell them, mention specific things that they have done that has blessed your life. Even from the smallest things to the greatest things, that thank you. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. It, it's, just, it, it's just such a blessing to say thank you. And here's number five. Look back on your journey and reflect where you were a year ago, three years ago, five years ago, and say thank you, God, for where I am today what you brought me through, what I survived, when I'm victorious over, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Doesn't mean that you have victory in every area yet, but you're on the right path. You're walking with Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. Glory to God. Amen. So those are the five ways to show daily gratitude. Then he went on to say, the attitude of gratitude is the highest form of thinking. And this is true because a healthy personality has to be centered up on thankfulness and gratitude. That's what a healthy personality is. And so the attitude of gratitude is the highest form of thinking. The more positive your personality, the higher your self-esteem becomes and the more popular you will be. I like the sound of that. Gratitude points us to a positive outlook and a positive attitude always leads to better things. 
remember that phrase that I just read. I'm going to read it again. Listen to this now. Gratitude points us to a positive outlook and a positive attitude always leads to better things. Positive attitude always leads better. Negative attitude always leads to worse. Nothing good ever happened after negative thinking. There's power to positive thinking. That would be a good book title. I should write that down. The Power of Positive Thinking. I can't believe no one's thought of that yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down. The Power of Positive Thinking. Glory to God. Amen. So individually as believers, individually as believers, we are a thankful people. Because individually we know what God has done for us. And it's good to give him thanks. You get up every day, bless the Lord, oh my soul. That's thankfulness. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. To be a thankful people. And that's a healthy personality. That gives you a proper personality adjustment, attitude adjustment, to, say, to be thankful, to say, God, you've done so much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And then when we come together in the corporate setting, as a church, as a body of believers, our church services are, we call them worship service because we're declaring the worth of God. And we start with praise and worship. Praise is thanking Him for what He has done. Worship is recognizing who He is. And so we start with praising Him for His goodness in our life. And it's a powerful thing. When you get a body of believers, believers together and it doesn't matter if you are in a different church in a different country speaking a different language when we're all come together and we're praising God it's powerful it's powerful you know it's powerful you know what because it invites the presence of God isn't that true? We'll enter his course with thanksgiving. And so when you praise, you're making entrance into the very presence of God, and it is powerful. Psalms 95 says, let us come before him, verse 2, with thanksgiving, and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Isn't that powerful? Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Don't come before before God saying, let's see if you can bless me today. Let's come before God with thanksgiving that, you know, if we do nothing else today, Lord, we're going to thank you. If we don't ever get to the word or, or the offering or the, we'll always get to the offering church. We will always get, <laughs> no, I'm teasing. But we're here to thank him. I said, we're here to thank him. Amen. Hebrews 12 and 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably in reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Oh, let us be thankful. Say, I'm thankful. I'm so thankful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's, that's why we as believers, when we go into the lion's den, and sometimes at Thanksgiving meal, you know, not everybody believes the way you believe and thinks the way you think, and not everybody's graced the way you're graced. And sometimes it can be a little bit of friction around that Thanksgiving table when you see somebody after a year, multiple years, that you haven't seen in a while. But you know what? We're the gracious ones. We, we are graced by God to be light and salt and to be a thankful people to God. And, and when we focus on Thanksgiving, to say, Lord, I'm just thankful that I'm here with my, my loved ones. I love them. Maybe we don't think the same way, believe the same way, act the same way, but I love them and I'm believing they're all coming in to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and I'm going to be a witness for Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to be a happy warrior, a witness for Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, as a pastor, and I'll close on this thought, as a pastor, what has me so, so excited about Thanksgiving is the national emphasis on Thanksgiving. I know for many folks, Thanksgiving is little more than turkey and cranberry and football games on television. I had to laugh. I was watching uh, one video on Thanksgiving 
and uh, it was a little too long to show in service tonight, but it was very, very good. And one of the points was, is that in that Thanksgiving feast, they were all having such a good time, the, um, those from New England or from England and those who were Native Americans, they, they had sports, they had games, they had athletics. And so they had wrestling matches and all sorts of games that went on. And for three days, it was a big time. They were enjoying themselves and it was a lot of fun and I thought nothing's changed because we have good food and everybody watches football and, and it's, it's still it's still sports I mean we may be sitting in a lazy boy chair now watching football I'm not interested in wrestling anybody you know old man wrestling that's not much to watch but but everybody enjoys sports and food and so nothing much has changed over the centuries but on a national level, we can reach back in Scripture to where God founded the nation of Israel, brought them out of bondage, and started teaching them about how to identify themselves as a nation set apart unto Him and how to approach Him through praise and through worship. And then David, King David, brought it to a national height when he gave the nation a psalm book called the Book of Psalms and he taught them how to worship and he taught them how to be thankful unto the Lord. And one of the exciting things about King David was before there was ever uh, Solomon's temple, there was David's tabernacle. And in uh, Jerusalem, in the city of David, in Jerusalem, David built a tabernacle. It was a tent-like structure. And when he brought the Ark of the Covenant that had been captured by the enemy, he brought it back into Jerusalem. Oh, how he danced before the Lord, such that his wife rebuked him, and then God rebuked her. And he danced, and he taught the nation how to praise. And he put the Ark into the, the tabernacle of David, and there was constant praise and constant worship and constant music 24 hours a day in the tabernacle of David and that is the type and shadow of the church of Jesus Christ that's where we as a church we get our spiritual foundations back from the tabernacle of David and so uh, David brought the Ark of the Covenant back and he taught the nation we're going to be a worshiping nation we're going to be a praising nation because God's uh, ark, God's presence, God's throne is right here in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And so we as believers, we have type and shadow. We have foundation. We have scriptural revelation that God desires nations to be worshiping nations. Blessed is the nations whose Lord is the God. And so we as the United States of America are called of God uh, to be a worshiping nation. That our institutions would be founded on the word and our institutions would bring glory to God. I'm believing God for that. The, the nation has kind of drifted away, but I say, come on back. Amen. Come on. I say, come on back. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, if you know David Barton at all, and I think he's great. He has a ministry called Wall Builders, and it's just fantastic. And I listen to a lot of his uh, videos and materials, his books, and we, we may have had some in, in our bookstore at one point or another. And so I just want to read a few paragraphs of one of the um, essays that he, ha he has written regarding Thanksgiving. And so he said, when the pilgrims left Plymouth, England, are we all doing okay? Is everybody okay? When the pilgrims left Plymouth, e England on September 6, 1620, their destination was the new world. That's us. We're in the new world, glory to God. But they were, uh, they were looking for religious liberty. For over two months, 102 passengers braved the harsh elements of a vast storm-tossed sea. You know, when you got on one of those boats and you went across the sea, it was likened unto now 
the astronauts getting in the Apollo capsule and getting shot to the moon. I mean, it was just as treacherous. It, it was just as hard, just as difficult, just as unsure about reaching your destination for those astronauts as it was, was for these passengers on these old wooden boats. And so they got into the harsh elements of a vast storm tossed sea. But finally, through divine providence, the cry went out, land, land, before them, and they arrived in Massachusetts in late November on December 11th. Just before dis disembarking Plymouth Rock, for at Plymouth Rock, they signed the Mayflower Compact. We can't go into that right now. So they had a prayer service, and the pilgrims began building hasty shelters. However, they were unprepared for the starvation and the sickness and the harsh New England winter. Nearly half died. Half died. You know, getting on that boat, going across that sea, getting to the promised land, as it were, and then burying half of those that traveled with you. How disheartening that must have been. Nearly half died before spring, yet persevering in prayer. Hey, church, let's persevere. Let's not quit. Let's not give up. Just because it's difficult, they persevered in prayer, and uh, however, persevering in prayer, uh, and assisted by the helpful Indians, they reaped a bountiful harvest the following summer. summer. The grateful pilgrims then declared a three-day feast, some about a three-day whatever, a three-day feast, starting on December 13, 1629, 1621, to thank God and to celebrate with their Indian friends. That wasn't the first Thanksgiving, but it was the first Thanksgiving festival, a three-day feast. Pilgrim Ed, Edward Winslow described the Pilgrim's Thanksgiving in these words. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, bird hunting, so that we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had given, uh, gathered in the fruit of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl as served the company almost for a week. Many of the Indians came among us, the great, their greatest king, Massasoit, with some 90 men, whom for three days we entertained and we feasted. So I think there was like 50 pilgrims, 90 Indians, and they went out and they killed five deer, which they brought in. And although it, uh, although it be not as plentiful as it was at that time with us, yet by the goodness of God we are far from want. That's called Thanksgiving. Amen. By the goodness of God we are far from want want. Everybody say amen. amen. Now, much of the credit for adopting the annual National Thanksgiving Day is attributed to Miss Sarah Joseph Hale. You know, one person can be a nation changer. This lady. You ladies, you get fixed on something and you don't let it go. Isn't that right? That's born a lot of good fruit in our nation, I'll tell you that. Sarah Joseph Hale, and she was the editor of Gotti's Ladies Book. For 30 years, she promoted the idea of a national Thanksgiving Day, contacting president after president until Abraham Lincoln responded in 1863 by setting aside the last Thursday of November as the National Day of Thanksgiving. Over the next 75 years, presidents followed Lincoln's president uh, and annually declaring a national Thanksgiving Day. Then in 1941, Congress permanently established the fourth Thursday of each November as a national holiday. Now, isn't it interesting that in 1941, the fourth Thursday of each November was a national holiday of Thanksgiving? Well, on November 7th, 1941, was Pearl Harbor. So in the same month, as Pearl Harbor, they, they were saying, we have to have a national day of thanksgiving. Isn't that amazing? I'm not surprised. Lincoln's original 1863 Thanksgiving proclamation came, spiritually speaking, at a pivotal point in his life. 
during the first week of July of that year, the Battle of Gettysburg occurred, resulting in a loss of some 60,000 American lives. In one battle, in all of Vietnam, we lost, I think, 53,000 soldiers. But in one battle of the Civil War, 60,000 American lives. Four months later, in November, Lincoln de delivered his famous Gettysburg Address. And it was while Lincoln was walking among the thousands of graves there at Get Gettysburg, he committed his life to Christ. As he explained to a friend, when I left Springfield to assume the presidency, I asked the people to pray for me. I was not a Christian. When I buried my son, the severest trial of my life, I was not a Christian. But when I went to Gettysburg and I saw the graves of thousands of our soldiers, I then and there consecrated myself to Christ. Amen. Psalms 33 and 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Did you get anything out of this tonight? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, on Facebook, I'll probably be posting over the next few days a few more.